Hello. Welcome once again to your favorite class in your favorite summer semester, Computer Science 1XC3, Computer Science Practice and Experience Development Basics. I am currently in Romania, and this is a pre-recorded lecture, um, the second of two, uh, which is intended to cover the lecture which will be occurring uh, on July 13th, which is actually the day that I'm going to be returning to um, my beloved country of Canada. Um, at any rate, the topic that we're going to be talking about today is pointers in C. Uh, pointers in C is a uh, reasonably difficult topic. It probably will constitute the main bulk of the difficulty that programming in C will cause you. Uh, it is a new way of thinking. It's a new way of understanding how computers work. So if you have any problems, questions, concerns with how pointers work in C, um, any questions pertaining to or following from this lecture, please feel free to um, ask those questions on the Discord, and uh, the TAs will be happy to help you out with anything that you might need. Um, so yeah, good. So pointers in C then. We're going to be talking about how one works with pointers, what operations are viable on pointers, we're going to be talking about passing by reference, arithmetic and pointer expressions, and dynamic memory allocation, which is a, uh, a topic that you'll want to pay particular attention to. So, pointers in C. When a wise man points at the moon, the imbecile examines the finger. If you want to read this comic, you may pause. I'll zoom in briefly for you. And there, you can read that on your own time. Ha! So, what the heck is a pointer and why should I care? Pointers are one of the most powerful constructs in C. A pointer is a variable whose value is a memory address. So up to now, um, you know, insofar as what we've been dealing with has not been pointers, we have been dealing with data directly. The When we assign a variable, we are concerned about the values held at a particular place in memory designated by the variable. That is what variables are, remember, is they are locations in memory. A pointer is somewhat different. It's, it's both the same and different. A pointer is still a variable in the regular sense of the word. However, the value of that variable is another memory address. So rather than representing data directly, a pointer represents data at a distance. You have to follow the memory address to the corresponding location in memory in order to access the, var the value um, that, a that a pointer variable is pointing to. Where most variables directly reference the value stored at some position in memory, pointers are called indirect references. So, in this set of slides, we're going to talk about pointer data types, pointer operations, and applications of pointers. Uh, incidentally, one big application of pointers is data structures. Although we won't be talking about that much in this topic, uh, we do have a topic coming up. Um, data structures in C which will fold in much of the pointer stuff that we're learning today. So pointers in C is going to be absolutely crucial for you to understand 
both strings and file I.O., as well as data structures. So, a pointer is not declared as a new data type, but as a modifier to an existing data type. So there's no pointer data type, right? What you get is you get data types like int star. Int star, uh, let me see if I can. Meh. At any rate. So <clears throat> when we put a star character after a data type, we indicate that uh, as a pointer to a value of that type. So the star character indicates that pointer, PTR, is an integer pointer. That is to say, pointer points to a segment of memory the size of an integer. This is very important information. In order for, so you have to consider things from the perspective of the computer. Just because you have the start address in memory of some particular value which you're interested in reading does not mean that you know when to stop. You know when to stop by knowing what the bit width is of the data type that you're trying to read. So that is provided by the, by the data type that we are attaching the pointer to. So because we know that ints are four bytes, we know that we start at the memory address indicated by the variable and we follow it along four bytes and that is the segment of memory that is indicated by the pointer. So the star character itself may be applied to either the data type or the identifier itself. Uh, it, does, it doesn't really matter. It's a matter of preference. Star, the asterisk or star character only pointerizes count pointer in this example, but if the star were applied to integer, count pointer would also still be the only variable, variable pointerized. So it doesn't matter where you put it, here, um, count pointer, only the first of these two will be declared as a pointer if you're declaring multiple variables on one line. If you want count to also be a pointer, then you have to include another star character right there. Good. So, in our now famous blue block o vision, If we have a variable called count, that count variable directly references the value it contains. For example, 7. Count references 7 directly. Count pointer indirectly references a variable that contains the value 7. However, this line is insufficient to accomplish that task, as we're going to see. A pointer indicates the position in memory where another variable can be stored. So, facts about pointers. You can create a pointer out of any data type, including custom ones. The star character means something different when you're not declaring a pointer. It's not a part of the identifier. So, uh, it is an operator, and it's correct to think of it as an operator. When we use count pointer in the rest of our code, it is no long it it is not necessary to uh, prepend the star character to that variable name. Star is not a part of the variable name itself. Since pointers are more a more direct manipulation of memory, you can squeeze out some efficiencies by squeezing in some pointers. So. Some optimizations are possible using pointers that are not possible without them, most particularly memory opera optimizations. Memory optimizations more so than runtime optimizations, although 
at a certain point when you start introducing more complex data structures in C, things like trees, um, at that point you do need to start talking about pointers. Uh, so pointers enable you to use complex data structures, which you can also get better runtime efficiencies out of, but uh, sort of in a direct sense, um, you can achieve better memory efficiency by working with pointers directly. As we're going to see when we talk about dynamic memory allocation. So, so here are a couple of stylistic points. To avoid the confusion on the previous slide, it's better to declare pointers and direct variables on separate lines. Putting some indication that a variable is a pointer in the identifier is a good way to be able to tell which variables are pointers later on. So, you know, count, count pointer, pointer, underscore pointer. You just, you want to put pointer in the identifier somewhere. Again, this isn't required. This is a stylistic point, but this can help you avoid some confusion later on. Trust me, I know what I'm talking about. So, like a lot of things in C, uninitialized pointers contain junk data. A pointer will initially point to a random memory cell. Pointers should be initialized to either zero, null, or a value that makes excuse me, or a value that makes sense. Although what makes sense will be different in different contexts. Null is a symbolic constant which is defined in a number of header files such as stdio and standard definitions.h. Null is a macro that is replaced by zero. However, it's preferred for stylistic reasons. Basically anywhere you use zero, you could also use null, but it's stylistically normally reserved to indicate null pointers or an invalid pointer. So, Good. So let's uh, let's open up a C file and start hacking away. Let me just minimize this. Oh, and boom! There we go. So here's a little C program that doesn't do much. We declare a v integer variable y. We declare an integer pointer y pointer. The next step is crucial. In order for y pointer to actually point to the address of y, you must assign the, the address of y to the pointer using the regular mechanisms. So we use the address of operator ampersand, which we'll talk about shortly, to extract the memory address of y assign that to y pointer. So if we execute this code, gcc pointers.c output pointers and run pointers, we can see that the pointers value is this long string of hexadecimal characters and the value pointed to is 5. Notice that if we run this a few times, a different location in memory is used each time to represent, uh, a, a different location in memory is used each time to store the variable. This is because on subsequent, it, uh, on subsequent runnings of this one program, the region of memory allocated to this program by the operating system changes each time. And although you'll notice that um, a few of these appear to be quite close together, um, remember that this is like close together should be measured in the, like the first three digits of this number. Um, <clears throat> Good. So, this is good. Let's talk about pointer operations. So, 
Now we know how to store a memory address, but what good is that if we don't have any memory addresses to store? Well, memory addresses are accessed using the ampersand or address of operator. Applied to any integer, it returns the physical memory address of that identifier. This includes pointers. So, in our previous example, the if we wanted to point if we wanted the address of the pointer this is an this is also something that we can um, call forth using the address of operator so you'll see that these two do actually fall reasonably close to each other in memory that's because they're memory that they're both memory which has been declared by the same program. You should notice that um, you know again the memory addresses are changing each time. So pointers and this is like this is a very very important concept so I hope you're paying attention. Pointers are variables you may find the address of a pointer that is the location at in memory at which the the pointer is being stored by using the same operator that you find the physical memory address at which a variable regular variable is being stored that's a, a very important concept when it comes to double pointers Good. So, if we have Y pointer and Y, where Y pointer gives the memory address of Y, in terms of like a disjoint view of things that does not include pointers, or does not include arrows, if Y is location 600,000, then the value of Y pointer will be 600,000, but the location of Y pointer will be some other point in memory. The inverse operation of um, finding the address of something is pointer dereferencing. This is a little confusing but point, the pointer dereferencing operator is also star. Personally, I would have preferred if they picked a different symbol, but there you go. Also, if you're printing a pointer, the uh, percent sign %p format tag will give you a pointer which prints out in hexadecimal. So, if we wish to, um, if we wish to view or if we wish to follow a pointer to the variable it points to, we prepend the star character in the same way that we prepend with the ampersand character. So the results are the same as if we had called y directly or asked to read y directly. So you can see the value pointed to is 5 both times. And if I modify y at some point in this program, oh, if I remember to include a semicolon, you'll see that the value is updated with both views. So it provides two different ways, two different means of access to the memory cell provided by Y. We can access the memory cell directly through the variable name itself. We can also access the memory cell through the pointer. Good. So, 
we can also use the dereferencing operator to assign to the variable through the pointer as well. So if we dereference y pointer and we place it on the left hand side of the assignment operator, we can perform assignment through the pointer as so. So, one thing that's very important about pointer dereferencing, though, when you're dereferencing a pointer, what you're doing is you're taking one of these memory addresses and you are looking up the value at that address inside of the system's memory. Now, <clears throat> obviously, some restriction must be played. Uh, must be placed on your program so that it doesn't read memory that doesn't belong to it. If, a, if, if any C program were capable of uh, reading or, God forbid, overwriting any piece of memory that exists in your RAM, uh, that would be a huge security vulnerability. Just an enormous one. So, the operating system checks each time a pointer is dereferenced to make sure that the pointer is addressing memory that actually belongs to the program. This is why you can't just, you know, for example, um, say that y pointer is equal to set, uh, you know, 10 and then get the memory that exists at address 10. If you try to do that, you will get what is called a segmentation fault. Segmentation fault. So a seg fault, uh, segmentation faults are abbreviated as seg faults. Seg faults are a type of error which you are very, very likely to see quite a lot as you're doing your assignments. Whenever you get a segmentation fault, essentially what's happened is that your computer is trying to read memory that doesn't belong to it. Your program is trying to do so. Um, segmentation faults are a fatal runtime error. So a seg fault will kill your program outright, no chance for redemption. Um, the most common way that you'll get a seg fault is if you initialize a pointer to null or have the pointer uninitialized, uh, so filled with garbage data, and then you try to dereference that. Um, there's a very, very, very small probability that uh, a randomly assigned integer will fall inside of the memory that's been allocated to your program by the operating system. So you can have a, f it, it will seg fault fairly reliably. Um, however, segmentation faults can be very tricky to sort of um, diagnose and remove. Um, a segmentation fault might only occur every third time you execute a program or something like that. Like, uh, seg fault is not guaranteed to happen each time. Uh, it will, it'll be guaranteed not to happen if your program is well written, but if your program has a bug in it that causes seg faults, seg faults might not appear every time you run your program. Um, most particularly, if you're performing some kind of access violation inside of a branch that's not being uh, exercised by your, the particular test case you're running. So, when we mark your assignment problems, uh, any of the ones that seg faults might occur in, uh, we run them several times and uh, essentially, you know, mark you down for the uh, percentage of the number of 
tri uh, trials that result in a seg fault. So, <clears throat> the referencing pointer that points to memory outside of your program's allocated memory space causes a fatal runtime error called a segmentation fault. This is most common with null pointers, but can also happen if you mess up your pointer arithmetic, as we will see. Okay, human. Eh. Before you hit compile, listen up. You know when you're falling asleep, and imagine yourself walking or something, and suddenly you misstep, stumble, and jolt to wake? Yeah. That's what a seg fault feels like. Double check your damn pointers, okay? The computer is sassy. So, ampersand and star are inverse operations, but only in one direction. So if we have a variable a, with, uh, integer variable, variable a, which has a value of 7, and a pointer to a, which we immediately assign the address of a to, if we print a, we get it normally. a is equal to 7. The address of a, uh, we access using the ampersand character. The value of the pointer will be the same as the address of a, and dereferencing that pointer yields the same value back again. If you apply the address of operator and then dereference that created reference, you end up right wet back where you started. So a with ampersand and then star applied yields 7. However, excuse me, the other way around, however, causes an actual compiler error. Under GCC, it, it, you are not permitted to dereference a variable. You are only permitted to dereference pointers. So, um, it, these are applied in order, order of closeness to the variable itself. So the first one that's applied in this case is star then ampersand. So because we're applying ampersand, or pardon me, because we're applying star first, um, that's an illegal operation. <clears throat> so, good. It can be easy to think of pointers entirely symbolically and forget that they too have concrete values. Pointers may be collected and organized into arrays, just like any other data type. So, let's, uh, so in this example, we have a constant character star array of size four that contains hearts, diamonds, clubs, and spades. Each element in the array is a pointer to a character array. The fact that our array contains pointers instead of the characters themselves means the character array's memory is managed separately from the array of pointers. Whereas a two-dimensional two array must be rectangular, each character array pointed to by the array of pointers may have a unique length. This is what this looks like in blue block vision. So we have our suit array. Each element of suit is a pointer which points elsewhere in memory. These, um, these pointers to elsewhere in memory point to strings. <clears throat> Hearts, diamonds, clubs, and spades. With, again, our null terminating character at the end there. <clears throat> so... If you recall, when declaring a two-dimensional data structure uh, in, in C, the, it must be rectangular, right? So if we were 
if we were trying to declare a two-dimensional array to contain these same values, um, we would need to use uh, seven additional memory cells versus what's being used here. So, and that is that is greater than the four memory cells we're using to create uh, the array of pointers. So we're in fact saving memory by using this approach. And this is like among the, this is a, in a very minor way, this is saving us some memory, but this is precisely the type of memory savings that adds up uh, when you are doing these types of operations at scale. So let's talk about how to um, how to pass by reference because this is a uh, this is something that's very common in C programming and something that you see quite a lot in the C standard libraries, most particularly um, the types of uh, functions we're going to see next week when we talk about string pro uh, processing. So in C, all arguments are passed by value, unless the value you pass is a memory address. So C uses uh, using uses an, uh, a scheme for passing arguments called pass by value. Uh, this is in contrast to some other languages, uh, most notably different varieties of BASIC, which use pass by reference. So in BASIC, you don't get um, you don't get the value that's passed in manually assigned to the argument itself. What you get is a reference to the original variable in the original calling function um, or wherever the data originated. In C, you have kind of a stop layer um, where um, modifications to a C argument do not have effects outside of that function. <clears throat> this is still true when using pass by reference, uh, when like when you pass a reference rather than passing a direct value. However, um, because you have to go to the extra step of dereferencing the variable, modifications to the argument itself will still be contained within the function. But because it's a pointer, um, you can dereference it to access the other piece of memory that's being referenced from inside of a function and by that in that way modify variables that are contained in the calling function within the function being called. So <clears throat> passing by reference allows functions to modify the referred data in the calling function which can be useful. Um, <clears throat> So if we have int foo and int bar, uh, int array bar, my function, and we pass the address of foo in, then we are passing foo by reference. We use ampersand to pass the address of foo, but bar is already a memory address because bar is an array. This is a very important concept. In C, an array is like the name of the array, the array identifier itself, is the address of the first element of that array. Always. That's how arrays are defined. Arrays are pointers. You access the various elements of an array using a, a pointer offset. So, inside the function definition, foo will need to be dereferenced, but bar will not as bar is already a reference. So here is an example cube by reference. So we have a function cube by reference takes an integer pointer and pointer. <clears throat> In cube by reference we take n pointer, dereference it and assign to it. So we are assigning to the memory address we multiply a dereferenced version of n pointer three times with itself. So we are 
looking into the memory cell represented by n pointer three times, retrieving the value, multiplying these values together, then taking the result, putting it back in that same memory address, cube by reference. So it, uh, from the in the main function, int uh, if we declare some very some integer variable num, assign it the value five, print its value before and after this calling of this function, and then pass it by reference, then let's see what happens. Before, uh, before calling the function, number has the value 5. When we enter the function, endpointer gets a, a, establishes a pointer, a reference to number, but that's contained inside of main's stack frame. We calculate the value of this expression, which is 125, and then assign it to this the end of this pointer inside of main. So um, when we print it out the second time, we'll get 125. <clears throat> and let's just see that in operation, shall we? There we are. So here's that function, or here's that program, I should say. GCC, passref.c, out passref, passref. There we go. The number beforehand is 5, the number afterwards is 125. It may be of some interest to put this into Python Tutor as well. One of the fantastic things about Python Tutor when working with pointers in C is that Python Tutor will visualize pointers for you. And I apologize, my computer is being a little, dragging its heels a little bit. There we go. We are currently waiting for the code to execute. So here we are. We have in our stack frame main, we have num with integer value 5, we print it, we then enter cube by reference, we create a stack frame for cube by, cube by reference, n pointer becomes a pointer to 5, it then, it's still pointing there, but this operation replaces this 5 with 125, and then we return execution to main, print the value of num, and everything's hunky-dory. In order to accept a memory address as an argument, that fact must be specified in the argument's type information. So in order to pass by reference, we have to pass in a reference, as you might expect. In this example, we replace the following operations. Um, with uh, We replace this with that. Um, this, these first bullet points are the operations that would be necessary if we were to do this in the regular fashion without pass by reference. So <clears throat> we would have to pass num by value into cube by reference, compute the cube, and return that to main using a return statement, and then assign the results of the the return assign that return value to num inside of main. With um, the way that it is here, the way that we've done it here, we pass the address of num to cube by reference which then computes the cube and stores it in the memory address, address directly. Stylistically, pass by value is preferred unless the situation explicitly calls for pass by reference. 
passing by reference in this way violates the principle of least privilege. Um, recall from 1MD3 me talking about the principle of least privilege. <clears throat> When you are designing software, one thing that you want to do is you want to only give programs as much permission as they need to perform the operation that they are performing, that they need to perform. Um, pass by reference is a way of getting around the traditional return value mechanism. The return value mechanism is useful, thus uh, trying to avoid it is problematic or can be in certain circumstances. So, arrays are pointers. The syntax for passing an array as an argument to a function is the same as passing a variable by reference. This is because the compiler does not differentiate between pointers and one-dimensional arrays. Well, it does to an extent, but uh, they're functionally equivalent. Like so many things in C, this means it's your job. It's up to you to write your functions so that they are using their arguments as intended. Documentation is crucial. An array is actually a pointer to its own first element. We can perform arithmetic to traverse arrays without the indexing operator. So, it's ac we actually don't need the indexing operator, technically speaking, in C. The indexing operator, the square braces where you specify the index that you wish to retrieve from an array, is in fact syntactic sugar for pointer arithmetic and dereferencing, as we shall see when we talk about pointer arithmetic, sh arithmetic shortly. But first, let's talk about const. Problem. Whenever we work with pointers, there's a possibility of pointer misuse, resulting in a seg fault. We can prevent arguments from being modified by using the const qualifier. So, and you'll see this all the time in the standard libraries, a const integer pointer is an integer pointer which may not be modified by this function. Essentially, it's a way of declaring this variable as read only. Trying to modify con the con a const argument will result in the following compiler error using GCC. Error, assignment of read only location. Using const to restrict functions from modifying things they shouldn't modify is good software design. In general, a program should only have enough data access to accomplish its task, and not one smidgen more. So, when writing functions, if the value that you're passing in is not being modified by the function, and should not be modified by the function, even if it's not a pointer, it's a good idea to use a const keyword and lock it in. This is good software design. This is fun. This is like C's attitude towards memory. Hey C, could you zero out the data? At, oh, let me just do it. Hey C, could you zero out the data at these addresses? A sure thing. Poof. Wait, did those, what data did those addresses point to? Looks like some kind of critical OS data kernel or some such. What? Meh. This is what C does. Uh, no clever quote this time, though I did learn that the internet seems to think indirect means passive-aggressive. Um, I don't know why, but that seems to be the case. So, Let's talk about arrays and how they are addressed. Start with a motivating example. So let's imagine we have int, uh, uh, end int array and a short int array, although these are actually floating point numbers. And let us view the subsequent addresses, addresses at which 
each element of these arrays is being stored. So if we were to do that, at least on one run, the addresses at which foo elements 0 through 4, you can see the address increments by 4 each time. If you, you know, if you know your hexadecimal, c is of course 12, 8 plus 4 is 12, and 12 plus 4 goes back to 16, which uh, pops this value from 9 to 10. There you go. By contrast, if we examine bar, which is a short integer, 16 bits, we're going up by 2 each time, rather than going up by 4. You may notice that an integer is comprised of 4 bytes, and a short integer is comprised of 2 bytes, and that is reflected in the array, uh, or in the... Um, in the memory addressing. So, in blue block o vision, the um, for each integer, we go up by four. So, notice in the previous slide how foo's memory addresses are four bytes apart, and bar's are two bytes apart. The array is continuous memory, and each element is allocated the size of the base data type of the array. If we wish to perform a pointer arithmetic to traverse an array, the compiler needs to know how big the steps are. Operators can mean different things when applied to arguments of different types. Uh, floats versus integer division, for example. When plus plus is applied to a pointer, it will automatically take the size of the data type it's operating on into account. So, in this example, we are using the indexing operation. But, it is possible to use um, integer, uh, pardon me, to use arithmetic on pointers to traverse the elements of an array as well. So let's, uh, and we have this um, this example right here. I think it's right here. There we go. So we have a string dated reference. We have a new uh, character pointer which points to this guy while this character pointer is not... Uh, so basically what we're doing is we're creating a loop where this foo pointer is going to be incremented each time and we are stopping when dereferencing that pointer yields the null character. As we recall with strings, all strings are terminated by an invisible null character. So when we dereference this foo pointer, find a null character, then we know that, <coughs> pardon me, we have reached the end of the string. We are, uh, for each character then, we print that character and closed in round braces and We obtain that character by dereferencing foo pointer, and afterwards we apply plus plus, which increments the pointer. The pointer is incremented by the size of the underlying data type. In this case, characters are one byte, so the foo pointer will be incremented by one byte. <clears throat> when this is finished, it prints a new line. The result is the output that you see below here. So, another way of going about this is um, to calculate the length of the, uh, the array prior to using it in the loop, and then using your regular, you know, number, uh, using your regular for loop syntax. 
In, so we have our size of function, which finds the size in bytes of various data structures. We apply that to foo. Uh, remember, things that pass through functions, uh, you lose the ability to use size of on them. Uh, so this is only usable in main effectively uh, for things declared in main. So foo, we get the size of foo, which will be the, so the number of bytes this string occupies. We divide that by, uh, we could do one of two things here. We could say the first element of the array, which is sort of agnostic as to the data type of the array, or we can use char here uh, since the L, since we know from up here that uh, the data type of this array is character. But let's just leave it the way it was. Then we can write a for loop and then we have uh, basically two ways of going about it. One way is to say foo at i. This will work and is perfectly fine. Um, the alternative way is to say foo plus i dereferenced. So so foo is a um, fixed pointer and we are calculating offsets from that fixed pointer dereferencing the offset memory and then taking that value. Um, one of the advantages of this approach as opposed to the approach above is that we do not require this additional pointer uh, because you know pointers are kind of difficult so the more of them you have floating around probably the less likely it is your program is correct. Um, but um, essentially, there's an implicit step here where i is multiplied by the size of the underlying data type prior to the modification of the pointer. That is how you align the reading of memory to the, um, the values that are actually being held there. Well, well, one might say that this step is what constitutes the size of the ver like the size that's actually held there. It's kind of a, a different way of looking at things, but if you think of memory as just being memory and not having like anything implicit about it, um, aside from the fact that values can be read from and written to it, um, how the memory is used carries a lot of the sort of implicit understanding that we have about memory. So it's not like the memory cells themselves know that they are an integer or a float or what have you. It's that the fact that the computer reads the same region of memory and you interprets it as an integer, that's what makes it an integer. There's nothing inher about, inherent about the memory that makes it an integer. So it's really this operation right here and the fact that the off the things being offset by the correct amount that's really what's making the memory into an integer but uh, you know um, that's kind of like a, you know an advanced way of thinking about it um, it's sufficient to think of the memory as having like data types associated even though that's not technically true so In addition to plus plus, we also have minus minus, plus minus, plus equals, and minus equals as available operations on pointers. In each of these cases, the number that you are adding or subtracting to, uh, to or from the pointer is implicitly multiplied by the bit width of the data type. For example, if pointer points to an integer, then pointer plus 4 would move the pointer by 16 bytes since the bit width of an integer is 4 bytes. So this means that you can effectively think of memory in terms of number of variables rather than number of bytes, which is a useful abstraction. Pointers may also be subtracted from one another, but only meaningfully if they point to the same array. 
So pointer A minus pointer B yields the number of elements or the number of memory cells difference between A and B, um, but not the number of bytes difference, right? So the number of memory cells as considered as a memory cell. Um, so if these two pointers point to two different memory, like two different arrays being held in different regions of memory, what you'll get is the sort of raw distance between those two pieces of memory, which isn't necessarily useful since that's going to vary every time the program is run um, because the memory being allo the way that the memory gets allocated is different each time. It's only going to be consistent within the same data structure. So, a word to the wise. In the previous example, tracing a character or array, array we used our knowledge of strings, uh, our knowledge that strings are null terminated to set a stopping condition for our loop. Pointer arithmetic can easily, quite easily, place a pointer outside of the bounds of its original data structure. I'm sure some of you will have noticed this already. In C, there is no built-in protection against out-of-bounds pointers in the same way that there's no protection against out-of-bounds uh, index, uh, array index, uh, array, uh, array index access. Um, pointers can be used to um, both read and assign to memory cells outside, outside the bounds of the array that they are hypothetically supposed to be inside. This means that you could overwrite other variables, cause segmentation faults, and many other troubles. Back in the day, this was a common exploit which was used to hack the government. Um, it was known as the memory leak. So, good. Um, <clears throat> There's also such a thing as a stack smash attack, um, which, um, let me see, do I have a, uh, hmm. Hmm. Well, at any rate, all right, so. Normally, pointers require compatible types to be assigned to each other. So you can't assign a character pointer to an array pointer and vice versa. The exception to this is the void pointer. So void pointers are pointers which do not have associated data types. Um, So basically, the data type tells the pointer how wide um, the amount of memory it's pointing to is. A void pointer lacks that information. So void pointers may not be dereferenced because you don't know how much memory you're accessing. Uh, you'll find that um, if you're wondering, well, what could be possibly be the use of this sort of thing, um, you'll find that a lot of uh, standard library functions will work with void pointers, and they do have a use. A void pointer is just a an indication of a point in memory, right? Uh, you can manually assign a width to it using casting. You can cast a void pointer to an integer pointer or a character pointer or a double pointer or whatever type of pointer you may wish. Um, but that's a manual operation. <clears throat> so, uh, void pointers are generic pointers that can point to any data type. A void pointer is compatible with all data types and may be used in assignment operations freely. The catch is that a void pointer may not be dereferenced. This is because the dereferencing operation uses the byte width of the pointer's data type to select the area of memory to return. 
So there you go. Uh, void pointers will become interesting once we t start talking about memory allocation, um, memory allocation operations. So, <clears throat> equality and relational operators also work on pointers. Relational operators are only meaningful if pointers refer to the same data structures, and equality comparison with null is quite common. So it's quite common to check to see if a pointer is null by comparing it to to null, uh, you know, e equals equals null. Oh, uh, there we go. I'm just going to quit that. There we go. So... <clears throat> That's a very common sort of thing that you would want to do. Many of the dynamic uh, allocation libraries that we're going to be talking about in the next section will return a null pointer if the memory allocation operation has failed. And you always want to check to make sure that the uh, pointer you're working with isn't null because dereferencing it will cause a seg fault. And incidentally, a uh, program running out of memory is enough reason to terminate the program anyway. So, also, array indexing, I've said this a couple of times, array indexing is actually syntactic sugar for pointer arithmetic. So foo at 3 is actually defined as dereferencing foo plus 3. Um, therefore, it is also possible to index pointers in the same way as arrays. One of the few differences between pointers and array identifiers is that array identifiers may not be assigned to. You can think of them as read-only pointers. This, by the way, is the reason that data structures inside of computers are zero-indexed. So the reason that you start counting at zero for any data structure is because you are reading the pointer with offset zero. That's what that means. It's not referring to first element. It's referring to with zero offset, right? So that's why zero indexing. And it's because everything is pointers underneath the hood. So, <clears throat> now let's talk about dynamic memory allocation. <clears throat> so, dynamic memory allocation is what you do when the memory that you want to assign to, um, the memory that you want your program to use uh, is not known up front. Pardon me. Perhaps your program is taking data in as it runs, and it has to find somewhere to put all of that data. Perhaps it's running for some period of time. Perhaps it's like running some kind of user interaction loop. At any rate, your program doesn't know how much memory it needs beforehand, so just, you know, allocating yourself a whole bunch of memory up front is not likely to be the uh, most efficient way of going about it. So, dynamic memory allocation. Up to now, our array sizes have been hard-coded, that is to say, set in the program code itself, not at runtime. In this section, we will learn how to allocate memory dynamically, allowing us to expand or contract arrays as needed at runtime. When we use static arrays, these memory operations are implicit. So basically, all of the arrays that we've been using so far have been using these procedures just in a way that's hidden from us um, so that we don't have to worry about it. Now, we are going to worry about it. The general procedure is to declare a pointer, invoke a memory allocation operation, and store the resultant memory address in the declared pointer. So, you have a pointer, right? You declare... you request some memory using a memory allocation f 
function, then that operation will return a pointer. You take that pointer and you put it into the variable. So all of the functions we're going to be talking about are contained in standard lib, uh, stdlib, standard library dot h. Um, we're going to talk about malloc, free, calloc, and realloc. So let's talk about the first one, malloc, memory allocate. Dynamic allocation of a single large block of memory given a specified size. So this is usage. <clears throat> Let's say we wanted to declare an array containing 100, or possibly containing 100 integers. We malloc 100 times the size of int. So the, the argument to uh, malloc is the number of bytes that you want to allocate expressed as an integer. So it's an integer coming in, right? But um, it's the number of bytes. Since size of int gives you the number of bytes uh, contained in an integer, multiply that by the number of integers you want, and that's the number you're allocating. malloc returns a void point. Ugh, pardon, pardon me. A void pointer, which may be typecast to the type of the pointer you wish to store the address in. So this is a cast operation. We are casting the void pointer returned by malloc as an int pointer and then storing it in the uh, in ptr here <clears throat> malloc may fail if the requested memory is larger than the available memory in this case a null pointer is returned you should always 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 check a pointer returned from malloc for null status before using it so this is um, another way of expressing it. So if we request 5 times the size of integer, which is, of course, 4 bytes, using malloc, then pointer is going to point to 20 bytes of memory. This is dynamically allocated. The memory is not assigned to this pointer at compile time is another way to think of it, but at runtime, very important distinction. Now that we know how to allocate memory, let's talk about how to deallocate memory. Memory allocated using malloc must be deallocated manually as well. So to deallocate is to take memory allocated to a program and return control of that memory to the operating system. If no memory uh, if no program deallocated the memory that it used, you would have to restart your program or restart your computer very frequently, as your computer would never receive back any of the memory resources that all of its programs are using. So basically, each memory cell would be single use, um, and you'd just have to you'd run out of memory, and then you'd have to restart your computer. The free function accepts a pointer as an argument and deallocates the memory pointed to. <coughs> Pardon me. As you can see, I'm still not quite over that cold. While it is not enforced by the compiler, freeing dynamic memory is the same as closing file streams. Very good practice. So, <clears throat> So if we have an, a pointer which has been allocated, right? Um, if we call free on pointer, all that memory gets chucked in the bin. You any like any data that's contained there is no longer yours. But uh, the um, the memory is returned to the operating system and may be used by other processes. <clears throat> so here's a simple example. Um, let me just see if I've got that. I do. It's right here. So
So we want to declare n um, cells in memory. We declare a in, an integer pointer which receives um, m alloc, which should be casted, cast as an integer pointer. Pardon me. m alloc n times the size of integer. If the pointer is equal to null, then we give a runtime error and return from this um, without doing anything. Then we print where the memory is allocated, we assign some values, and then we print the array, and then we return. After, well, we return after we freed the array. So let's, uh, let's take a look, see how this works. dynamic.c out dynamic there we go so we are allocated array we are allocated memory at this address um, the allocated array is given by this and uh, that's it you can see it's out, it's uh, assigned each of the numbers 0 through 29 in sequence. And uh, <clears throat> so there, there you go. That's all she wrote. Good. So <clears throat> the so when you use malloc, you're simply given memory um, that, and that me you're, you're, you're simply assigned these blocks in memory, but that memory is not wiped before it's given to you. Again, nothing means anything without context, so it's impossible, it's, it's impossible to tell where this memory may have come from, what the values might mean, but Essentially, what I'm saying is malloc gives you a segment of memory that is filled with garbage. Because it's filled with garbage, allocating memory using malloc is a constant time operation. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, the garbage isn't useful. Perhaps you want to... Um, perhaps you want all of this memory that you're being given to be wiped before it's given to you. In that case, you have an option called C alloc or calloc. Um, so calloc accepts two arguments. The first is the number of chunks of contiguous memory to allocate. The second is the size of these chunks of memory in bytes. So the way that you interact with calloc is also slightly different from the way that you uh, interact with malloc. <clears throat> malloc also gives you, um, malloc gives you a, um, it, it only takes input from you in the form of the number of bytes you want to allocate. Calloc asks you how many and of what size. So it like performs that multiplication for you. It also returns a void pointer. Um, and aside from this difference with the inputs, usage is exactly the same uh, as with malloc. The only difference is that calloc overwrites every memory cell it gives you with zero prior to giving it to you. This of course means that it takes uh, it takes an amount of time to do that proportional to the amount of memory that you've requested. So it's a big O n operation. But if you want that uh, if you want that memory overwritten with zero anyways, um, this saves you having to write a loop to do that. So, with C alloc, we give it the number of things we want, we give it the size of those things, and then it gives them to us. Good. So, in addition to all of this, we have realloc. 
Um, so we know how to allocate. We know how to deallocate. But <clears throat> what if the amount of memory we need, what if the size of an array needs to change during runtime rather than, you know, simply be created or destroyed? <clears throat> In that case, what you want is realloc. Realloc allows us to change the amount of memory allocated to a pointer while keeping the data already inside of it. So it's a fairly complicated operation, but um, this is how it goes. So if we allocate, for example, um, 40 floats, and then we reallocate it to uh, reallocate that same pointer to a different size, 100 times size of float, then the first, uh, this pointer will be resized to the second size. Um, realloc's uh, arguments are first, the pointer that you want to resize, and second, the size that you want to resize it to. N any new memory chunks that you get will be filled with garbage data, and uh, realloc returns a pointer to the newly allocated memory. So the thing, so you'll want to overwrite pointer with the results of realloc once it's finished. <clears throat> so um, it allows. So essentially, how it works, the date. So this is the realloc um, operation broken down, right? If the if in memory you have enough room to expand the current uh, expand the data structure that you're uh, trying to expand, it will do so in place. But if it can't expand in place to meet your request, it will try to find a new place in memory to place your data structure. It will then allocate that new data chunk copy all of your values over, and then deallocate the original memory cell. So, poof, it, it, it disappears. Um, so, the value of the pointer may or may not change as a result of a realloc operation. But, um, as long as you don't get a void pointer afterwards, the your new... Um, the memory that you now have will be um, larger or smaller depending on the size that you requested. So that's how realloc works. So, good. So that's pointers. Um, if you have any questions, please ask them on Piazza. And uh, see you on Monday. <laughs>